Well, if you would, start the journey to find the little tiny book of Obadiah. Um, you will go past Hosea, Joel, Amos, and then if, you, if your thumb catches something, you might wind up in Jonah. Well, it's right before that. So find Obadiah. I'm going to do my best not to repeat things that were afforded in that introduction because I think that it was very well done, incredibly succinct, Um, and those things usually work against my own personal introduction, so I'm going to go ahead and let the brevity serve me uh, well in that. um, uh, But it is important to understand a couple of things about this book as we head into it. Um, The time period of the prophecy of Obadiah, which we know very little uh, and virtually nothing about him, Um, we know his name. And it just simply means the servant of Yahweh. Um, We know nothing about his ordination. Um, What we do know is because of the brief content that we're given in the text is that most likely he wrote this in the uh, probably like 530s, 550 BC. Uh, Really where that would put it is, as we've talked about this, um, the, the minor prophets cover a period of time of around 350 or so years. Okay, and then you have maybe up to 400, and then you have about a 400-year intertestamental period, okay? So those two things combined give you 750 to 800 years. The period of the, uh, of the minor prophets really finds in the middle of it this somewhat catastrophic but very God-ordained event of the Babylonian captivity. And really, in a strange way, it's, it's in a sense a reunification of the nations of Israel. Because if you remember, up until that point, we'd had split kingdoms of Judah and Israel. And that occurred uh, as a result of the children of Jeroboam and Rehoboam and really some division over the use of the land and perspectives of God's purposes. And basically, had a split of the 12 tribes And really in that, they had for a couple hundred years this split kingdom of the north and the south. Well, just prior, the Assyrians had come in and captured the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom was spared at that point. But as we looked in Amos, very clearly, God is going to bring a standard of holy righteousness and judgment upon all the nations, including Israel and Judah. He first deals with the northern kingdom. They go into captivity with Assyria. And then, and even though they are spared in large part because of God using Hezekiah and his brilliance, uh, his strategy, uh, just God-given wisdom uh, strategically uh, to avoid the the assault of the Assyrians, it wasn't going to work against the Babylonians. And so the Babylonians did come in and they end up taking... Now, right after then, then, as a result of that captivity, Jerusalem fell. Okay? And it became kind of a seat for the Babylonian Empire as well, kind of an extended Babylonian Empire. Well, part of that, as you saw up here, is Edom. And Edom in that southeastern edge corner, um, they basically had become a, a vassal state or basically they had locked arms. They did this regularly, actually. They would lock arms with whoever they thought was the more powerful nation to be self-served in that way. Okay, they had done this before. In fact, back in Exodus, when the children of Israel were coming through, one of the reasons they had such a a non-linear path to the promised land was because as they were trying to come back through, Edom would not let them through. Now, God, again, takes particular issue with this because, again, they have their roots as Israelites, as does Israel. And so with this, this contention, this strife has gone on and really in many ways continues to go on. Now, with this, we need to understand that this vision, this revelation uh, of Obadiah as he speaks this, this prophecy against Edom, that even just as, as Evan read a few minutes ago, Jeremiah, when he prophesied, prophesied closer to 580, somewhere in between 580 and 620 BC. So if this occurred in the 535 to 550 or so realm, then his prophecy that actually was read about in that Jeremiah passage prophesies about the fall of Edom. And Obadiah is basically there prophesying about it in time as it's occurring. Now with this, as we will see, 
very simply. And my, my division, uh, and, and, and the description was, was right, there are two divisions. Um, I'm actually including what he calls the hinge piece, verses 15 and 16, in the first part of the division. But it still remains a, a very important transition in this book, because even though these are real events, okay, these are real and actual historical events, historical peoples, we also do understand that this is exemplary, endemic. It is a parable of all the nations and God's holy sense of justice, God's deliverance, God's mercy. So what we're going to look at first is simply this idea that there are indeed enemies of God. God does have enemies. We need to understand the nature of being an enemy of God to understand then what does it mean then to be a friend of God. But the truth is, is that if we really read Scripture and understand it for all that it says about humanity, Adam, meaning Edom, if you understand that, then you understand that all of humanity is born an enemy of God. Even the Old Testament, as Paul quotes in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That every single human being ever born since the original Adam is an enemy of God. No one is born a natural ally or friend of God. No one. That would go against Scripture. So therefore, that removes any possibility of some kind of natural born, naturally ethnic friend of God. So all then must become friends at some point after birth. Now, surely God had his chosen people and through the chosen people had delivered to us the law, the covenants, what we understand to be the nature of redemption itself. But in that redemption, we understand even here in Obadiah, as we have seen in Amos and in Joel as well, that what God is doing among his own people is something that represents what God will do even among the nations. And I think it gives us some insight into what we can hope for, what we can hope in. Now, first of all, what does it mean to be an enemy of God? What's, what's exemplary in Edom about being an enemy of God? Well, the first thing is simply this, pride. The proud are enemies of God. Now, again, remember, we're born enemies. You don't become an enemy because you become more prideful. Pride is simply an outworking, a resulting fruit of being an enemy and remaining an enemy of God. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we look at this, and we've already given some history up here, I do want to give you all this as well. So when Israel, after, I already said after they left the Exodus, as they sought passage, they were denied through Edom. David led Israel to conquer the Edomites in 2 Samuel 8. And then through Solomon's reign, the Edomites... Uh, were, were ruled by Israel eventually, okay? Then the kingdom split in, uh, to Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And then at the time of Babylonian attacks, instead of assisting their neighbors as they had been regularly, uh, Edom joined in the forces against the nations. Now, it's interesting. As we look towards Christmas, the Herods, the Herods, these kings, almost all of them are from the region of Edom including Herod the Great, who sought to kill Jewish boys two years and younger when they heard about the Christ. Now, as we look at this pride, you can see it exemplified in the New Testament in passages like, and you don't have to turn to these, but I, I would encourage you just to jot them down and refer to them later. In Romans 9, chapter 1, this begins that section in Romans 9 where Paul is addressing both Jew and Gentile believer and God's use of his sovereign grace in saving all and how he administers his grace over time, in time, in different ways. Paul says this in Romans 9, I'm speaking the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Okay, he's talking about his fellow Jewish kinsmen. They are Israelites and to them belongs the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, 
He's very clear. You have to look at that prepositional phrase, according to the flesh. So it's not automatic that even though they were, all these things were given through them, that they will all receive the promises of them. Otherwise, why would he say, I wish my own soul, flesh would be accursed? Christ took this curse. But what the point he's making is, whether you are Jew or Gentile, if you reject Christ, you are rejecting the covenant promises. You are rejecting what he has promised for all of his people. And he says, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And it's a really important understanding as we look at how the New Testament starts to play out when it comes to understanding when God establishes his kingdom and when God establishes his new Israel and his new Jerusalem, as you even saw in the graphic and also as we read in the scriptures here in this book itself at the end, he makes a transition from, yes, the people of God, the chosen people, Israel, there will be a remnant that has a restoration of their land, but it's a land that blesses and includes all the nations. So basically, as surely as it is exemplary, and surely as there is some kind of physical fulfillment, and I'm not smart enough to know exactly what that looks like, I also know it's not final. I do know that. Because the final fulfillment of what Jerusalem is, is not a physical, geographically bound area. It is actually a spiritual kingdom. As Christ himself says in Matthew 5, when he was being interrogated by Pontius Pilate, he said, my kingdom is not of this world not geographically, nor the means by which, because he says, if it were of this world, my people would be fighting to establish kingdom here now. But he says it's not. So whatever there is in, in regards to a physical fulfillment in Jerusalem, whether it's already happened or whether it's in the future, depending on your eschatology, your belief of end times, there still is one to come that is spiritually realized that is inclusive of all the nations. I mean, just read the description in, in Revelation of the borders of the New Jerusalem. It's mind-blowing. And whether or not those are actually, those stadia that it lists really cover that much of the landscape of the earth or not, I don't know how exact that is. I just simply know that its description is inclusive of every tribe, tongue, and nation. Why? Because the covenant promises coming through Abram are afforded to all the nations to anyone anywhere who is called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. That is the beauty of the offering, but there is risk. We need to understand that pride says that instead of needing God to save me, I'm good. I'm good. Now, part of that usually also includes a lack of understanding of what it means to be sinful and against God. So part of pride would be not only I'm good, but well, I'm not that bad. When you look at how God deals with the sins of nations, you start to understand that you, you, can, you can look at the way that he would destroy and judge certain nations and peoples along the way. And you say, man, that's a little overkill. And you're going, no, it's really actually biblically, it's just about right. Because God's holiness cannot withstand the presence and propagation of sin. So this pride, as we look in verses 1 through 4, the vision of Obadiah. How's that for an introduction? That's all we get on the guy. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord and a messenger has been sent among the nations. Rise up, let us rise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be utterly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the clefts of the rock. So yes, physically. So if you've ever been to the Middle East, and, um, or if you've seen, I think it was the third Raiders of the Lost Ark when they filmed it at Petra, um, that, that in, inland uh, fortress, that's Edom. Right above that is where the fortresses were, where they actually lived, but they had fortresses literally built into the rock. They felt like they were impenetrable that they could not be conquered. And their physical location and the physical way they came against the nations or fortified themselves represented the pride that they felt. They literally looked down on everyone as well as certainly then from a prideful standpoint. He says, who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? 
though you soar aloft like the eagle. Again, they're, they're up high, literally. They have, they have a good vantage point. In a sense, everyone that would come against them, if, I mean, especially if they had munitions, then it would be a kill box because they came in through the valley. But it was a perfect choking point for them to uh, be decimated, at least according to human terms. But he says, though you soar like an eagle, though your nest is among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. Pride. Thinking too highly of themselves. Along with this, this pride also comes with a view of possessions. Look at verse 5. If thieves came to you, if plunderers came by night, how you would have been destroyed. Would they not steal only enough for themselves? If grape gatherers come to you, would they not leave gleanings? The idea here is they gathered for themselves much. And because of the way they treated the Israelites, you understand that in their plundering, and as they plundered other nations during the Babylonian uh, invasion and eventual captivity, in that plundering, they gathered for themselves great wealth, a lot of goods. Their pride basically said, this is ours, we deserve this. We deserve this from all the loss that we've had to Israel, to Judah back in the day. But no, it goes on. In this, he says, how Esau has been pillaged, his treasures sought out. Now think about it. Do you remember, you remember the, the story of Jacob and Esau? You remember the exchange that was made? Literally gave up everything for so little. And that mentality continued on when he then begat a nation. Esau has been pillaged, his treasures sought out. All your allies have been driven, have driven you to your border. Those at peace with you have deceived you. They have prevailed against you. Those who eat your bread have set a trap. You have no understanding. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy the wise men out of Edom and understanding out of Mount Esau? And your mighty men shall be dismayed, O Teman, so that every man from Mount Esau will be cut off by slaughter." And even just giving you the terminology of Mount Esau, it just basically emboldens and strengthens this idea of, again, you think you're fortified. You think you're okay. But God's hand will always reach. The judgment of God upon the prideful, those who do not depend on or say or declare that they need God, instead, for the sake of building up their own kingdoms, pillage and go after others or oppress others or look down on others. We've already seen this in Joel. We've seen it in Amos, that God does not suffer the nations that actually look down upon other nations as if they're not human. And it wasn't just the other nations that did this. It was branches of Israel like Edom, and it was Israel and Judah themselves. At different times in different ways, they would literally step over the oppressed, even of their own kind in order to gain more. It all is an expression of pride. Pride is exemplary, illustrative of those who are enemies of God. And he will break that pride. Those, and God has done this all along the way. The babbles of the world, anytime we have tried to ascend to God-like heights, God has brought the people down. Again, remember, we are born enemies. Perhaps by God's grace, we can become friends of God. Now, another mark of those who are enemies of God is those who are violent, who seek violence, who long for violence, no matter what the justification may be. He says, because of the violence done to your brother Jacob, shame shall cover you and you shall be cut off forever. On the day that you stood aloof, on the day that strangers carried off his wealth and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem, you were like one of them. And then verse 12, but do not gloat over the day of your brother in the day of his misfortune. Okay, so again, in their pride, they were rejoicing that their enemy, Israel, were actually coming under captivity. They were now falling and Edom was rejoicing, reveling in this fact. Finally, they're getting theirs. But the spirit of this would apply to any of us who may see others as less than human to rejoice in their downfall. Look at what he says. 
Do not rejoice over the people of Judah in the day of their ruin. Do not boast in the day of distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. Do not gloat over his disaster in the day of his calamity. Do not loot his wealth in the day of his calamity. Do not stand at the crossroads to cut off his fugitives. Again, they were trying to escape the Babylonian captivity, and they took in those who were trying to leave the refugees, and they captured them, killed some of them, turned the rest of them over to Babylon. Do not hand over his survivors in the day of distress. Pride and violence. Whatever it takes, you know, if your position won't get you there, but pride knows no end. You will then step and stomp on others in order to maintain your level of what seems like superiority. Now, maybe you're in this room and you, and you think, you know, you don't necessarily feel like this is as grossly revelatory of maybe how you live. But you do need to think about how do you think, how do you feel when it comes to others? What does this expose when from your position you ask yourself, why do you rejoice at the calamity of others? Now, it's one thing for God and his justice to roll forward, but at the same time for us to hope for mercy and grace. But it's another thing altogether to think that because of people simply look a certain way or live in a particular part of the world or even believe things that are contrary, we have to ask ourselves, is that consistent with the thought process that God would encourage? Would that represent a friend of God? Those who are prideful, those who long for violence to support their own position of loftiness, those are markers of the prideful and God will come against them and God says that they are still enemies. And then you have verses 15 and 16. He says, for the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. And this is the transition that the introduction video showed us. And it's really important, but it helps us understand, yes, God is going to come against a specific nation he's mentioned up through verse 14, and that's Edom. But then he extrapolates that out to all. This is why the title of the message is the relentless reign of God. Because God's oversight and God's holiness, and, and it's even limiting if you put this from God's perspective, is universal, cosmic. But for all that we know to be the universe and the cosmos as finite beings, there's no molecule, there's no edge or corner, so to speak, of the universe. I don't know if there's a flat universe theory, but you have corners there. But anyway, whatever it is, the idea is simply this. As long as God reigns, remains, and is present, his holiness resides. And therefore, anything contrary to the holiness of God will be judged one way or another. And that judgment comes against the enemies of God who are marked by pride and violence, and it includes then all the nations of the world. In verse 15, <clears throat> this day of the Lord, as you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. For as you have drunk on my holy mountain, so all the nations shall drink continually. They shall drink and swallow and shall be as though they had never been. Now, this idea of drinking or swallowing, it's literally like pouring out the wrath of God. We see this imagery and this terminology in Revelation. You, we even see this and hear this in songs of our own nation. But the wrath of God being poured out. Okay, and the, the thing is, is that, I mean, it's not, I'm not saying it's waterboarding, but the idea is, there, there certainly is, you have no way to keep your mouth shut when God is pouring out his wrath on you. Your mouth will be opened through a set of circumstances and his wrath will be poured in and it will affect every part of who you are in all of your pride and your violence that's come against God and his people. This will be poured out on you. But it applies to the nations and not all the nations were coming against his chosen people because that's not the real point. The point is God's holiness. So he says, you're on, your, you're on my holy mountain. God owns it. They thought it was theirs. They thought it was something that they could rule from. But God's saying, no, I reign and rule over all. 
and everything I reign and rule over is holy by my standards and has to be judged. Again, guys, this is why you can't say, you know, I'm better than so-and-so or I'm not as bad as so-and-so because the standard is God's pure holiness, untouched at all. This means the only ones who are friends of God are perfect. Okay, well, how can you be perfect and not be prideful about that? Well, he kind of makes that clear in his process. So we go into this section of what are the friends of God, starting in verse 17. He says, but on Mount Zion, there shall be those who escape, and it shall be holy. Think about that. There will be a remnant, and that holy remnant will be there. And as they are there, it will be a holy remnant in a holy place. But by nature, everyone is unholy. So he begins, he begins to help us understand that it is he that causes those who were enemies, those who had been against him, to become holy. Only God can do this. And the house of Jacob shall possess their own possessions. The house of Jacob shall be a fire. And the house of Joseph, a flame. And the house of Esau, stubble. They shall burn them and consume them, and there shall be no survivor for the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. And in this process, what you end up seeing is that just as surely as God's sovereign hand judges those who follow in the line of Esau, it is also God's sovereign and gracious hand that rescues and redeems the remnant that would come out of the line of Jacob, so to speak. Now, there are various views of what this restoration of Jerusalem and the house of Jacob looks like. There are many people who believe that perhaps this was, even when it comes to the geographic borders, perhaps it was restored during the revolt of the Maccabees in 170 BC. Because as they shot out and, and spread out and came back in, uh, it's part of what happened to the intertestamental period of time. You had Alexander the Great come in, wipe people out. You had the Romans come in, but before they really set up shop, Maccabeus established a revolt within Jerusalem because of what the people in the area were trying to establish as a threat. And what they did was for a little bit, they actually drove out Edom. The borders of Jerusalem extended to include the land that Edom used to take up, but no more because of what happened to them here. I'm not even saying that's necessarily the case. I'm just saying there are some people believe that that kind of geographic restoration has already occurred. Some people believe it happened further in the second or third century. Other people think that it's something that is starting now or will happen later on. Here's what I do know. I do know that Matthew 25, when Christ speaks of the restoration of his kingdom, and when he speech, speaks of his kingdom, he makes it very, very, very clear. It is not a kingdom that's acquired by violence or military force because he said, my own people would take up swords. It is a gift of God for those who kept covenant with him. And we also know this about the future part, okay? The future part would be the final part, the part where he comes and he reigns and really all the enemies have been vanquished and Satan himself has been vanquished. We know that that is certainly a spiritual, spiritually realized understanding of New Jerusalem because it is all the nations from all of time who have shown faith in either the coming Messiah if they died before Christ came or trust in the Messiah if they came after Christ had already ascended. We do not have to divide over any of those other interpretive matters at all. But we do need to understand that it is only through Christ that the covenant is kept. If you think someone can come to realize heaven and the kingdom of God apart from Christ? I'm sorry, but we have no fellowship. You must come through the person of Christ because he, by Paul's definition and by Abram's promise, was the only promise keeper that was ever prophesied about on behalf of those who would come to him. That's the offspring that the promise was made to that line, those who would come through Christ. So regardless of what we think about the, the realization or the restoration of Jerusalem itself, we know this, that friends of God are actually delivered enemies. They've been delivered by God's grace. They were enemies, but now they've been delivered to him. 
even when Judah is taken and Israel both are taken in the captivity with the Babylons. God used that to bring back, but part of it is a judgment against those two nations of his own people or the two kingdoms of his own people. And then when the Persians then come in later and you have Cyrus as a fulfillment of prophecy who then releases them to go back to Jerusalem, there's a semblance of restoration going on. They all go back. They're reunified in Jerusalem. They go back with Ezra first. About 10 years later, another group goes back with Nehemiah. And then Nehemiah wrote us a great book in the Old Testament on on how to have building programs for the New Testament church in America. I'm just kidding. That's how people use Nehemiah so much because he rebuilt the walls and people, I grew up hearing sermons on uh, this is how it can help uh, our building program, our capital campaign to build new buildings. Um, and, and they would use Nehemiah as a launching pad. Um, sorry, it's, it's a little angst and frustration to me. But the fact is, that's only actually half the book. It's really more about the restoration and the recovery of the law of God and practicing worship before God as a people. And the walls literally become, yes, it was a fortification under Nehemiah, like against enemies, but it was more about the establishment of the foundation of the word of God among God's people. And one of the first things that he reminded them of was where they had forsaken, remembering how God's presence kept covenant with them even while they were in the wilderness. One of the first things that they rediscovered when they were with Nehemiah and Ezra back in Jerusalem, trying to build up from the rubble after Jerusalem had been destroyed by Babylon was they had lost what this thing was called the Feast of Booths, which was a commanded remembrance that God was with them in temporary tents during the 40-year hiatus while they were going from Egypt to the Promised Land. That's no mistake. He references back over and over again, when they were in Egypt, partially that was not just an innocent captivity. They had lost the practices of the law. And God jealously guards those that will become his own. So friends of God are first delivered enemies. Only God could preserve a remnant. There's no physical, geographic reason for there to ever be a people who would ever proclaim God. Not just in the Middle East, but really in the world. God preserves his remnant always. And some of the largest numeric uh, remnants that we have in our world today and over the last hundred years are in communist countries. We sung about the underground church, those who gather underground. Far more will gather underground or have already gathered underground on what was their Sunday than will ever, ever gather in large, wonderful places and buildings in the West, whether Europe or in America. So many more will meet in places that hate them. There's no reason for there to be a remnant apart from God in his grace delivering them and preserving them. It is such a God-focused preservation. This is why all the more reason God would never share the accomplishment of his prophetic fulfillment with the armed forces of men. He's not going to share the glory any more in salvation than he would in the restoration of his people. So whenever we have conflicts, we understand them to be, we hope to be just causes, but we should not overly spiritualize some of those things because we understand that God will establish this in his way, in his time, and it will be undeniable even to the most ungodly, the most atheistically perceiving person that it was the Almighty. And these delivered enemies aren't just rescued out of enemy territory, they become holy. They become sacred. They become set apart. And in being set apart, they end up then becoming his very own. They take up residence in his kingdom. Look at what he says in verse 19. Those of the Negev shall possess Mount Esau. Okay, so Esau is going to be then taken over by those that God has caused to be a remnant. And those of the Shephelah, shall possess the land of the Philistines and shall possess the land of Ephraim and the land of Samaria and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. The exiles of this host of the people of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath. And the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad shall possess the cities of the Negev. 
Saviors shall go up to the Mount Zion to rule Mount Esau, and the, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Now, again, I personally don't think that we should uh, extrapolate each one of these phrases to be something just figurative. I think this, there's literal restoration that we see here. But again, remember, this is illustrative, exemplary of what God will do with all the nations. So Obadiah is speaking, in a sense, within a confined space of vision to see that God is just, God is holy, and God is going to do a work. And and God is also, though, going to raise up a remnant. And those who are his friends are the ones that have been delivered. They have been made holy. And then they will be established in his kingdom. And this is exactly what we see in the New Testament. This is exactly what we see as God restores and saves us. There is only one ruler over this kingdom, one. In Matthew 12, 28, it says, but if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Christ alone is the kingdom ruler, none other. You need no other. We don't need men. We don't need rulers of men to preserve Christianity anywhere in any way. We don't. The gates of hell will not prevail against his remnant, his church. So we need to be careful where we put our hopes. And in Matthew 25, 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is a futuristic thing offered to any and all of the nations that would call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. So how are we then made friends with God? Romans 5, 10 and 11 says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God, and here's the first way, or the initial part of the way, by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. Christ lived perfectly a holy life, but Paul's also referring to basically his resurrection. He is alive. And that means the perpetuity of Christ, the fact that Christ is alive, means that his perfection and his sacrifice and his death, him drinking the cup of wrath of God on behalf of those who believe, because he's alive, that wrath has been removed from those who believe on him. So his judgment was poured out on his son for those who believe that Christ's death and death alone could save them and believe that he is risen so that it's finished, it's final, it's complete, and it's sustainable for eternity. How do you become a friend of God? You have to realize you are an enemy in need of rescue and that the rescuer is Christ and Christ alone. Christ and Christ alone. More than that, we rejoice, carrying on in verse 11 of Romans 5. He says, more than that, we rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Christ and Christ alone reconciles the enemies of God to the holiness of God. In Romans chapter 11, 25 to 32, it says this, lest you be wise in your own sight. I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. Okay, so this is the rescuer. This is the one who delivers the enemies to a holy God. He will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. He's already said that that Israel will be inclusive of nations, all those who come in, both Jew and Gentile alike. And yet he then comes back to the imagery of the children of Israel to this idea that he then takes away all of their sins and he includes them in the covenant language. He says, as regards the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. But as regards to election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now you have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have been disobedient in order that by mercy shown to you, they may now receive mercy. I mean, he does acknowledge there's a difference 
between being a Gentile who observes what God has done with the Jews and a Jew who is again the elect people. But he has already said in chapter 9 of Romans, he said, is it an advantage that Jews are Jews? He says, of course, they have the prophets, they have the words. But you know what he says, the very next phrase, he says, but it's of no advantage to them. Meaning, it does not save them. He's saying literally that the pouring out of salvation upon the Gentiles now is creating a longing for the Jews to really be part of what they were initially to be part of in the first place. A covenant-keeping people realizing that only through Christ is that covenant keeper. And then in the end of it all, you have covenant with both Gentile and Jew through the one who kept the covenant promises, the Christ. They too, uh, in the last verse in verse 32 says, For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. So basically, we're all disobedient in our different ways. But the fact is, we are all enemies of God. We're all in need of reconciliation. And that reconciliation can only come through Christ. And you know what it produces? Do you know the characteristics of the friends of God? Humility. The opposite of the enemies, which is pride. Humility towards God and peace. He's broken down the wall of reconciliation. And even then he's talking about Jew and Gentile. But part of the marker of those who are of the gospel, they long for peace. They don't hunger for war. We can express it in different ways, but the idea here is that those who are of Christ, who are friends of God, speak, think, and even feel differently than those who are enemies of God. The world thinks in terms of pride in so many different ways. The world thinks in terms of violence. And do we not see it even both in our nation and other nations abroad that even those who say and claim peace, they seem to want to accomplish that with a boatload of violence? But the Christian, the one who is really of God, that desire should be humility because God alone has rescued me because I once was an enemy. They never forget that. And peace. Because they understand that as enemies, they deserved all of the wrath. And for them to even think that someone else deserves more wrath than they deserved at one point is both prideful and, in a sense, violence. We should want peace. Wherever we can see it, find it, even as Paul said, as it regards you, live at peace with all men. You can't control how someone receives your apology if there's some breach. But that's not your call. You don't get to hang over someone's head. Well, you didn't accept my apology, so I guess I don't really forgive you after all. What? That's the stuff of nine-year-olds. We are to be ubiquitous in our offering to forgive and even ask forgiveness. We should be marked by humility and peace, not pride and violence. So the question as we close is simply this, are you a friend or do you remain an enemy? An enemy is simply any and everyone who has not come to Christ as the only one who can make them friends of God and trusted by faith that he has reconciled them to the Father who is holy and perfect, true and good. Have you by faith come to Christ and Christ alone to be saved? If not, you remain in the crosshairs as an enemy of God. I implore you, come to Christ and be saved. Now, Christian, if you know that you are indeed a friend of God, then examine your heart and ask yourself, do you drift into pride and a desire for violence in various ways? Or is your longing for humility, remembering from whence you came, and peace and ask him to deal with you on this so that you can live your life in a world filled with strife in a way that is so contrary to the world that perhaps someone would see it and ask like Peter would say why do you have this hope why are you like this and Peter would say be ready to make a defense at any and all times be ready all right let's pray God I pray that you would help us to become people of marked by humility, marked by longing for peace, 
Lord, I pray that you would help us to trust uh, your economy, how you're going to work out all things in the end, what even current events in our world uh, seem to represent or not. I pray that we would, uh, Lord, instead of giving our time and our efforts to trying to figure out puzzle pieces of future events, rather, God, to trust that you and you alone have a kingdom that's not of this world. It doesn't accomplish, you don't get kingdoms and lands in the way the world does. You already own it all. And whatever kingdom will be comprised of all the nations, all who called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. So Lord, I pray that we would focus on the things that we know to be certain about what it means to become friends of God. And in that, may we long to be the people with humility and peace, live in such a way that the world just might ask, what is up? And that we would be ready to say, all I can tell you is in a sense, once I was blind, now I see. Once I was apart from God and now he's made me part of his. Help us to be careful to speak it in such a way that there was nothing we did but receive what he showed us and caused in us to receive. So that they actually would have hope. Hope that maybe they can too. So we leave all this with you this day, Lord. It's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. Amen.